So good afternoon. Uh, I would like to, <clears throat> to welcome all of you to, to another uh, event of the, uh, the Codexon Rio Campinas, which is a uh, partnership or cooperation with the uh, Institute of Computing of Unicamp and uh, the, the Department of uh, Informatics of uh, PUC Rio. And the aim is actually to, um, to disseminate and to uh, uh, the, uh, the newest um, uh, knowledge in computer science, not only to, uh, to, to the, uh, the academic community, but as we, we will put this also on YouTube, then uh, so other people can watch it and can see what is uh, being done in uh, uh, IoT and uh, artificial intelligence in deep learning and so on and so on. So uh, it covers many topics of uh, computer science. Uh, and uh, it's organized by, by Professor um, uh, Anderson uh, Rocha, which is the uh, director of the, the IC in Unicamp and, and myself. So I, I would like to, to uh, welcome uh, Sami, uh, Helal, uh, he's a well-known uh, researcher and uh, professor in the areas of pervasive and mobile computing. So I, uh, I even have here the, the, the first paper which I of, of viewers which I read and I said, wow, that's very interesting. It's called uh, uh, Client Server Computing in Mobile uh, Environments. So this was a very long paper, I think a survey paper, it was very interesting and, uh, and uh, it helped me to, to decide uh, to work in this, in, in this field. So well, thank you very much for writing this paper and, and I, I was very uh, uh, pleased in, in, uh, uh, in having you here and now to, to, uh, to have uh, to give a, a talk to, to us. So uh, 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 Subi uh uh, works now at the uh, University of, of uh, Florida in Gainesville, but he has uh, has had a leave to the Lancaster University. Now you stayed there for one or two years, uh, and then you you decide that you you like more the Gators. You want to to go back to the Gators to uh, to see the games, isn't it? So so okay. So uh, so it's a it's a very huge. <clears throat> Uh, uh, pleasure to um, to to have you here with us, and uh, I would like to ask you to to start your talk, and uh, it will be probably a very interesting talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Mark, very much. Uh, I will start the talk here, but I just want to uh, uh, warn you that. The talk uh, has a lot of computer science in it, but it's packaged in a very specific application area. Uh, I gave this talk recently uh, in October last year in uh, Korea in a, a famous conference called Jiren Technology. Jiren Technology is like gerontology and technology. It is so, so the domain of aging, uh, gerontology is very dominant here in this talk. Which, in my opinion, is is a good is a good opportunity for computer scientists to, uh, for every uh, PhD student or researcher doing something to understand uh, in which way you can contribute to a very highly applied uh, area that is of uh, great benefit to society. So, as I go from uh, in the presentation at the beginning, uh, is a lot of positioning, but then the lessons learned, as the title says. Uh, will be basically the computer science work that uh, we try to do here. So let me share the, the screen. You see the presentation in, uh, in show mode, okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's perfect. Great, okay. So I am associated with the University of Florida, as Marcus mentioned. I still maintain some visiting a status with Lancaster until I finish uh, my two PhD students. So smart home, smart home in a box. Uh, it's a kind of a catchy uh, phrase that everybody likes it. So I uh, keep using it, but I'll talk about uh, lessons learned in designing assistive intelligent environment for uh, uh, graceful aging. 
So I will first give a word uh, on what smart homes uh, are and then uh, show you the evolution of smart home technology. Because if we understand the evolution as a technologist and computer scientist, we should really be able to um, sort of uh, interpolate, position ourselves uh, into the future because uh, there's a lot of research done already. Uh, so uh, yeah, of course you have to read literature. You have to understand what happened. But it's important to know the trajectory. So the evolution of smart home give you that trajectory. So that's really uh, the benefit of putting it uh, or covering it in my presentation. After that, I move on to a second part of the talk where I talk about, okay, uh, what we have done, the Gator Tech Smart House. Uh, Marcus know very well why, uh, what the name Gator means, why we name something Gator here, because he has been to, um, to uh, University of Florida and to Gainesville. We have alligators. Uh, that run in our ponds and lakes. And therefore, a gator is a short for alligator. And uh, uh, we, our, our uh, uh, university has a lot of, uh, had to do with gators. We use it in our emblems and in our uh, uh, publicity and so forth. So the Gator Tech Smart House is just a smart house. We named Gator Tech. That's the one I founded here in Florida. I'll present it quickly and then now dive into the lessons that we learned in that uh, Gator Tech Smart House experience. Uh, and then I finish off by talking about Smart Radio Home. Uh, we know, maybe we know about Smart Home, but what the heck is Smart Radio Home? Uh, that actually will come in the evolution. You will see it. And now I'll tell you a little bit about it uh, before we conclude. So what is a Smart Home? In the, in the context, again, a Smart Home uh, for... Uh, for a young couple is different from a smart home for uh, a married uh, couple with three children. It's different from uh, an older couple living alone, enjoying a uh, healthy life. Uh, different from a single older adult living alone at, uh, and suffering from some conditions and chronic disease. So you can see, of course, it's a, it's a big question to ask because there isn't a single obvious answer of what it is. But uh, here we're talking in the context of successful aging, meaning uh, older people living in a home and try to make it, try to uh, maintain some quality of life until they graduate. So what is a smart home in that context? Uh, it might be a home that provides physical assistance. Okay, so just getting out of the chair at an, uh, uh, an old age become a problem if the chair can push me up, understand that I'm trying to get up and you just give me a little tug, a little push. Hey, that's great. That's a physical assistance. Uh, provide cognitive assistance. You want to start becoming not necessarily dementia, but uh, forgetful. So I need some cognitive assistance to remember and, and think of that nature. Um, a smart home is a home that recognizes what the person is trying to do. I'm trying to prepare breakfast. I'm trying to go to the bathroom at night. Um, so what if it's really a smart home, it should be able to recognize what, what the user is trying to do. Recognize uh, even the intention. What is the intention, not what is being done? Um, for example, a person in the kitchen, the intention is really making tea because it's not breakfast time, it's not a meal time, and stuff like that. Help complete tasks. Uh, if it understand the activity, I recognize my intention, might be able to help me uh, complete task. Ensure safety. My safety is important. Uh, safety, like when I sleep at night, it makes sure doors are locked because I might not be able to check that myself or I may have forgotten. Uh, relieve social isolation because this is a big problem in older adults. So as I go, uh, you will see so many things. Help in preparing meal order necessary supplies, fall detection to, uh, to uh, send warning quickly, uh, dehydration detector, uh, so I don't get dehydrated, serve as a health platform for long-term condition. Um, uh, enable remote uh, healthy uh, living, um, uh, give me some reminder about medicine, adapt to my needs as I age more and more, I become older and older, it also adapt to me. So we can keep going here, with more options. It's like, wow, that's overwhelming. Are you here to present us all this? No, I've just started the discussion about what the smart home 
could be or what it is. So what you can see from this picture is something very interesting that you have to be a, a, a superman or a super team to actually do uh, all this. So the, what you conclude from this slide is, okay, it's impossible for any single group or single researcher to, to work on all this. Hmm. That immediately evoke a famous keyword, ecosystem. So you can see here that smart home must have an ecosystem. Otherwise, this is impossible. You cannot achieve all these uh, potential end games. And I'm not done. To, uh, smart home could also be accessible and safe for frail users. So accessibility, when I, when I covered all this, sorry, when I covered all this, I didn't talk about accessibility. Now I'm gonna dimension all this for people who are uh, with certain uh, disability, like frail people, uh, visually impaired people, uh, people who are hard with hearing or deaf, uh, people uh, who are wheelchair uh, user, uh, uh, and then people who have uh, uh, living with very chronic condition like seizure, uh, tremor, uh, and, and dexterity issues, dementia, all, all these conditions. So now uh, a smart home should be able to do all that I showed you in the first slide, but now that I mentioned it in all these kind of people, people who don't have any disabilities and people who have all these, uh, one of these disabilities, this is a lot. I'm not done yet. Third slide is, what is a smart home? It, it, smart home is not smart if it doesn't monitor my activity uh, to understand um, uh, uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly, to understand what I'm doing good, what is not good, and so forth. It monitors user health. It, it uh, analyzes and reports the user health. It monitors user behavior and lifestyle. It analyzes user behavior and lifestyle, not just monitor it, but analyze it and so forth. So you can see here after it does the basic things and then it does it for all people, disabled or non-disabled, we, we now need to move into something that's positive, which is, well, how can I stay even healthier and, 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 and uh, uh, have my health and my activities monitored and uh, analyzed so that I can actually uh, escape trouble. So there is so much that needs to be done to actually say that we have smart homes, okay? So to, to really understand uh, 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 smart homes, we have to uh, think of smartphones. There is actually a significant similarity between the two. Um, first of all, a smart home is, a smartphone is too many things in one. It has all kinds of application. We do everything with our smart home everything so it's too many things in one but that's exactly what i just showed you that smart home was also too many things in one uh too ambitious and evolving now, what i showed you also is very ambitious no one can can do it impossible to deliver without a proper ecosystem that's the key word so when we say let's do research in smart home uh, and uh, you actually get a space the university give you a space let's say and now you're going to start putting some sensors and devices. Uh, you have to wait here. It's like, wait a minute. We, we have done that. Too many people have done that. That's not the issue now. The issue is we want you to contribute, you and your student and your, your research. You need to contribute to the ecosystem. You need to make smart home so mainstream, exactly like smartphones. That's the research area. That is where things should be, that's a little bit of the trajectory. I'll show you more specifics and detail of that trajectory, but that's what you want to remember. It's the ecosystem that will make smart homes as uh, complete and as fulfilled as smartphone. <clears throat> Let's talk about the evolution here. Evolution of the smartphone was that uh, until, 18, uh, until the 1800s, uh, we didn't have anything, right? We just, uh, we had uh, no smartphone. We had books. We had uh, stones to write on. We had papyrus. And then there was a gap from 800 to uh, 1987. That's 187 years of, let's say, 
uh, our thinking about sciences and engineering, we started to move. And now in 1987, the Newton came from Apple. And that was the first sort of uh, uh, personal digital assistant. And it came and nobody understood it and it died very quickly. But 20 years later, something called the iPhone came. And the iPhone sort of marked the success and the beginning of true smartphone forever. And not just for itself, it wasn't just a single product. You look at it in 2007 and you look at Steve Jobs when he's announcing it, you think that's an Apple uh, achievement. Well, it was an Apple achievement, but it's more than that. It was an em embarking of the ecosystem. That's what happened. They created, the Apple created the ecosystem that on which this became a mainstream technology. So uh, the ecosystem basically was was uh, were there to capture opportunity where hardware innovation came to be very helpful. For example, the uh, multi-touch interface that was invented by some researchers in Carnegie Mellon University. Microsoft bought their patent. So Microsoft had the patent for multi-touch, but they put it in the drawer. And then Steve Jobs realized this is exactly a major element. That's an essential element of the ecosystem because they tried to create hundreds, if, if not thousands of devices, they used to call them handheld computers, PDA, you name it. And the form factor and the, and the buttons, all that stuff was too difficult to figure out what is right, what's wrong. But if you have just multi-touch, if you have something very intuitive, uh, instead of buttons and all that, that will work. So that was one. GPS and camera also came on the phone and th those change everything. Location-based service, we cannot do anything without these maps. And the camera, everybody and now taking photos and life is good because that thing has exactly the hardware that just made sense. Okay, so the hardware, innovation was part of the ecosystem. Emerging powerful platform technology. At that time, we were used to operating systems, Unix, uh, uh, Microsoft, but but smartphone came up with the idea of a platform. Don't, don't, you don't have to start from an operating system to do anything. You start with a platform and the platform has a lot of package things. So developing in, a, in an Android, for example, in the early days of Android, you use a platform with, with certain uh, uh, profiles for location, positioning, for telephony, for this. So life became more, more streamlined. So platform pr provided focus for technology developer, for application developer, and so forth. So the idea of a platform, iOS today, I mean, we ended up with just two platforms. Uh, and Android is part of the ecosystem. Appropriate business engagement model also was a big element where before the iPhone, companies would try to make most of the profit out of developer. And here, uh, Steve Jobs reversed all this. So um, what is the evolution of the smart home then? If I'm bringing all this analogy, so what is the evolution of smart home? So in 1975, something happened. Uh, an interesting protocol called the X10. Some of you may remember it, but uh, uh, most of uh, PhD students probably will not, have, will not have heard of this, but it's very old. But it was a power line communication, PLC, to control appliance. And that uh, brought a lot of ambition into home automation. And then wireless technology came, the Z-Wave and others it kept going. And then in uh, uh, 25 years later, the beginning of uh, hype dub, you can call it hype dub or experiments where, for example, Georgia Tech came up with the aware home. You may have heard of it, which is, well, let's really create homes for societal benefit. Well, here it was for aging. And uh, University of Florida uh, and Georgia Tech are the, are the two strongest universities in the South, in, in the United States, in the Southeast. So of course, in the University of Florida, we got jealous. <laughs> so, and we, we, we had to do something like Georgia Tech. In fact, we got uh, Georgia Tech's main person here, uh, Professor Gregory Abbott, to consult for us, to tell us how can we do our own smart home. 
who is kind enough to actually help us. So we created the University of Florida Gator Tixmer House. So that's part of the evolution is these early project. Of course, there is more than these two smart homes, but I'm just mentioning them in to show the evolution line. And then in 2012, something happened here. Um, Samsung is a very early adopter. Koreans are early adopters. So Samsung really sort of crossed uh, the, the bar very far and, and they came up with Samsung smart thing. At that time, the world internet of things started to rank. Cloud computing was established and also the word edge computer started to rank. Edge computer is what connect the internet of things to the cloud through the edge. And also uh, human computer interaction matured a lot by 2012 to the extent that a major industry put out smart things to create smart home with it. In other words, the first building blocks for smart homes that make sense, that's more streamlined. Yet it's still from one vendor. 2014, 16, so now we're coming into our current time closer, many things happen. So uh, uh, these devices like smart thing from Samsung started to learn. So you have embedded in artificial intelligence in them. So Nest started to put IoT devices, which is the Nest thermostat that learn many things about your behavior. Are you in the house, outside the house and try to optimize for you. Uh, and also some other technology that came that's very powerful, which is voice technology. So Alexa uh, and the like, uh, all these in created a very powerful interface for smart homes. So much so that Apple created the, uh, the HomeKit, Bosch created uh, their HomeKit, Google also created Google Home, their HomeKit. You can see now the big giant companies converging in that timeline they see exactly like, like uh, 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 Jobs saw that the hardware, the right hardware was in place, the multi-touch, the GPS, and the camera. He saw that. And they see that also, these big giant, they see that now the ingredients are in place. IoT, Internet of Things is there, edge computer is there, cloud computing is there, and the interface was now perfected because you can do a lot with voice. You just feel like you... Uh, you know, uh, you can ask your house, I forgot what I was doing. Can you remind me what I was doing? You can say anything. You don't have to press a button. You don't have to know the technology that, that much, okay? So the voice technology came and now the giants creating the kits. That's 2014, 2016. To 2022 or today, uh, that is my analysis. That's where I, I look at where this is going. So we're going to something called smart ready homes. I refer to it also as smart home in a box, which is a blueprint of a smart home ecosystem. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, uh, the rest of my talk will show you what it means and we will regress back to that slide. But that's the next thing. Now that you have better hardware, better devices, intelligent devices, you have the infrastructure around them really in place. You have your edge computer, you have your cloud computer. You have the voice technology, all that stuff is there. What is missing now is, as a part of the ecosystem, is how do we do it? How do we create smart homes? And what it means to create a smart home? And what's the life cycle of a smart home? What is the life cycle of a smart home? And can a smart home really be relied on? Or will it kill people? Or will it be responsible? If I sell a smart home tomorrow, will I get be put in prison because I caused trouble? See, there's still still a lot of things to take care of here. So that's the idea of a smart ready home or smart home in a box. Okay, I'm sorry for this very long introduction. Uh, now we move quickly, but uh, the smart ho ready home will make all this possible. And uh, will also uh, make uh, the, this ability thing to disappear. Now, let me move into the second part of my talk, which is, lessons learned in designing the uh, uh, smart home for graceful aging. That was the very first smart quote, quote, home I built in the lab, which is smart door. Try to figure out you want to make anything smart. In the same lab, I created that mock-up zigzag structure to be a house 
uh, of an older adult and I, uh, I have a mini can on the base because I wanted to experiment with positioning and location and ultrasound, sorry, uh, ultra wide band transponders to find location. So we st started to understand uh, what are the issues in building smart homes so that uh, I'm not theoretical. Uh, and that led me to some uh, thoughts and uh, I was lucky to be able to raise funds to create an actual house it's called the Gator Texmar House, and that's in a retirement community, as a matter of fact. And uh, when that happened, I was very happy, but then very quickly I realized, oh my God, I got myself a disaster. I have to make a real house smart. Here is my lab. I can do things. <laughs> I can uh, make it look the way I want, but this is a real house. Um, but we, we gain a lot of uh, experience, a lot of pain, but a lot of su some success. We learn a lot. And then I moved to England. And when I moved to England, part of why I moved to England is uh, they have really interesting projects known as healthy new towns. So there were 10 healthy new towns done by uh, NHS, National Health Services of England. One of them was uh, sort of anchored to Lancaster University. And, and uh, this is a green grass, meaning it's a land that's empty. So NHS, uh, give some funding and the government give funding. It's like, okay, you have no excuse. Uh, create a healthy new town. Uh, uh, design it the way you want. You want to make it look like uh, weird, do anything. It's green, green grass. So no excuse. But at the end, after you finish, we will run an experiment for five years and 10 years to see if actually people health outcome is changing. People are living a better quality of life, better living longer, life expectancy, blah, blah, blah. There's a whole metric of that. So that was a huge project. And I got sort of involved in it from the digital health uh, thematic issue. That was an amazing project, far exceeded the smart house. But that's the ambition. And that's where the, the full uh, line time and evolution of smart home started to dawn on me. It's like, no, no, no. You cannot use a smart house to build this village. You can't build smart homes. Smart home is a bad idea. You got to build smart ready homes. So I will explain more what I mean by, by that. But that's where it dawned on me. It all came to me. If I didn't go through this, so I'm very glad I went to England. Um, I, I'm an adventurous person. I like to move a lot. But uh, the gain here was just totally unexpected. The gain is to realize that what I have been working on for quite some time is inadequate. It's, it's missing very critical elements. So that's the word ready. Instead of smart home, smart ready home. I will show and I'll say more about it later. So in a nutshell, the impact of a smart home on health is easily attainable. Impact on people's individual behavior and lifestyle is hard. Integration into health delivery system would be one of the uh, forces of change shaping the future of health. Predicted positive impact on quality and cost of care and overall quality of life. Uh, I'm, this slide, I shouldn't have put it here um, because I will get back to it. So what is the issue to create a whole smart community is changing people's behavior. That's one of the most difficult challenges. Changing lifestyle, changing behavior. How do you get people who are lazy to not be lazy? Okay, how can you keep people who eat the wrong thing to eat the right thing? It's not easy. We have something called population health. Uh, everywhere in every country has a population health department and it put out information about how to live healthy, how to live longer. Doesn't work. The, the existence of the information itself is inadequate. Okay, and that's an obvious lesson. Nobody can deny it. So there, there must be something additional needed in addition to the information. Um, this is a simple experiment. I don't want to spend too much time, but just showing you that Liverpool, that was play, that's still playing right now. Liverpool is a city in, in England, and it is characterized by something really scary. The average life expectancy of people in Liverpool, the average is 10 years less than the average in many areas in the United Kingdom. That means that this city, people in this city are very unhealthy. 
So one, why? Because they have diseases. Okay, let's pick one famous disease there. It's COPD. And, and, and that disease uh, is a pulmonary disease, basically congestive uh, uh, obstructive uh, uh, pulmonary disease has to do with, with many causes for it, but at the end, the, the, the lung become inefficient, right? So uh, the United Kingdom did an experiment with help from Phillips. And the experiment was to just take about 2,200 people, 2,000 people, 2,200 people, and try to put them on a different uh, pathway of treatment, which is quote, quote, smart home, and digital health, remote remote care, and and put them in it for about a period of time. I can't remember, nine months or one year. So basically, it's just a small device connect your TV and a lot of phone calls from the nurses based on the information they're receiving, and this is this is the end game here. So so this study was just to show uh, will it really make a big difference? Because they want just even trace of evidence and look at that. Uh, forget the paperwork, but hospital admission. So if you take a, a, a control group of the same size, let's 2,200 patients of CO, uh, COGP, if you take them, what is their admission rate is X. Now take that uh, treatment group or a, a smart home group, what is the admission rate? 35% less. That's a big number. That's a significant amount of money and time and effort and capacity. Okay, uh, use of a and &E. &E means ambulance, uh, emergency service. The use of, of, of ambulance cars to transport people is less by more than 50%. Hospital bed days has been freed. So it is 60% less. 60% of the hospital beds are freed. And there's so many other important things, a nice positive thing, but there, right there is the eye opener. So just focusing on one disease in one city and providing only one technology, what, what you see here, something very silly, two uh, medical devices connected uh, to a gateway that connect to the TV. And the TV has like an input and output channel. So you go to channel 99, that is the study channel where messages happen, video to learn, all that stuff. Wow. So even... Uh, so therefore, uh, smart homes and digital health really work. In, in, in a very small experiment, the, the promise is huge. Back to get a tick smart house. That's how it looked like. That's where it's located. Um, this is a retirement community, and that's a smart house. The retirement community here is a continuous care, meaning it has uh, regular homes, to restricted homes, to group homes, to medical facility. So when the person age, he doesn't have to sell his home and buy a new home or chain, call his son, say, son, move me somewhere. No, you enter the Oak Hammock CCRC, you graduate from Oak Hammock CCRC. That's, that's the idea. Okay, and this is the team. So all of a sudden I have, my team used to be just uh, males. Uh, no female, my engineering, and, and all of a sudden, by working in an interdisciplinary team, we have uh, female researchers. Uh, we even have uh, end user, like here's a wheelchair user. We have the whole thing. Things start to become more balanced. So that's another uh, side uh, note I'm making here is that interdisciplinary research really uh, solve uh, gender issues and uh, in, improve diversity in a, in a very big way, naturally, without having to pretend or to, to do any special measure. All right, so, um, so I started to talk about the smart homes and tell you that uh, smart homes should be able to do all this crazy stuff. And it was very overwhelming only to make the case that, okay, smart home cannot be just a research topic that you go and say, I'm gonna create a smart home uh, there is an ecosystem, you better position into the ecosystem itself first. And I showed you an analogy with the smartphones. And then I uh, showed you the evolution of smart homes. And I told you the next big thing is smart radio homes. And then uh, I tried to make the point that smart home will actually change health outcomes. And now uh, I showed you that the nice picture of the Gator Tech Smart House. But now uh, where is the computer science still? What, what did we try to do? Okay, so these are the lessons that we learned. 
So the first lesson, we refer to it as the box principle. And the box principle is, is a favor. You do it to yourself, to your, uh, to your advisor, to your university, uh, to your society, as a matter of fact, yeah, but to yourself also, because the box principle is to think outside the box. We all want you to think, get great ideas. Definitely think outside the box, but keep one constraint in there, which is think outside the box only to put it in a box. Well, what does that mean? It means that you should innovate near the commercialization boundary. Don't uh, innovate uh, anywhere else. As you innovate things, you always bounce it back to your heads. Like, will, will, can this ever be uh, a product? Can it be made a product easily? Or is it going to be very difficult to make it a product? So you always think that way. And if it's not easy, drop it. Just keep thinking. Keep innovating, but innovate closer from the commercialization boundary. If you do that, whatever you come up with become easily commercialized. The whole world will go after you. You want to patent your work. You want to buy your work. You, you yourself can actually create product that will be successful, not highly risky. So that's the third thing is uh, we realize we are doing all kind of stuff. Many of them had nothing to do with that principle. Many of them will never go anywhere. And that's where we started to stop and say, okay, that should be part of our research agenda is the box, the box principle. Let me show an example. So here is a, we have a fantastic smart floor. Uh, everywhere in the smart house, we have this raised floor. You can see here from this picture, it's a, it's a, not a commercially raised floor, it's a residential grade raised floor. And it's plastic, it's a, some kind of a fiberglass and has these metal connectors. And it's nice and easy to walk in. And it has tiles. So all these are tiles with uh, nasty glue. You can see the color of the glue, the green. Here is a tile flipped over. So you put it in, nice. If you drop coffee, no problem. You can take the whole tile, throw it away, put another tile and easy on your back because it's ergonomic, it's beautiful flooring. Okay, so we said, well, let's use that. So we can put our electronics underneath, we can do many things. We need it to detect the location of the person. We need it to also count how many steps Mr. Johnson is taken, has taken today. Is he active or is he not active? Is he uh, perkly walking? Or is he barely, barely walking and just dragging his feet? We need to know everything, right? So that's uh, so we've started to put all kind of stuff. We created uh, a system in which every tile block is accounted for. We're able to sense if the person is on it. We're able to also create an estimator for the energy. So we're so excited about it. But then. Uh, imagine you go to a home somewhere in Rio, you want to make it smart, and you say, oh, I'm going to do like universal floor, the smart floor. Well, good luck, because this is going to be too difficult. It's going to suck up all your budget. It's too difficult. It takes an engineering team, and it cannot replicate it easily. You cannot put it in a box. What does it mean you cannot put it in a box? Meaning you cannot go buy it, uh, let's say to your grandmother's, uh, send ship it to your grandmother's home, and you or some technician come and install it in two hours maximum, and you have smart floor. You can't, so this doesn't fit in the box. Whereas this fit in the box, sorry. What is this? So this, instead of doing it that way, you use completely different technology. Instead of pressure sensors and, and sensor platform, now you use very high precision accelerometers. So, uh, Many companies and many uh, many places use very high precision uh, accelerometer. There is even a Swiss company that show you uh, an accelerometer that's touching grass, and you can be five feet and you do something on the grass and it will sense the vibration. Grass on soil, you can get create them very accurately, but of course the price go up. So you need to buy or use an accurate accelerometer. Place them on the floor and power them from the wall plate. Put enough of them. If you put enough of them, now you have signal coming all over the place. This picture here of the section of the smart house, the Gator Tech smart house, has about, let's say, 23 
this 23 create 20 uh, equation, 23 linear equation that need to be solved. Once you solve them, you know what the person is. But then you have furniture and you have a lot of uh, obstacles. These create noise in the model. This noise can be learned very quickly initially, and it can be factored out to know where the true per location of the person is. Not just that, there are estimates like this equation here show you estimates of uh, energy, the energy expended in certain vibration. That's the difference between barely walking and perkly walking, right? You can even get there with a much better technology. You're putting these units in a box, they can fit in a box. You go, you power them and you pull them down like a retractable thread, let them touch the floor in several places, done, you have a smart home. Then that should be the research agenda. This should not be the research agenda. This should be okay. And a massive engineering product, pro project. And we, we, uh, we appreciate what we learn, but it's, it's way outside the commercialization boundary. This is near the commercial boundary. So we focus on it, even though we realize it's extremely challenging. So we discover that uh, based on the shoe type, so if the person is not wearing any shoes or wearing a hard shoes or soft shoes, the results are very confusing, very difficult with flip points. Flip points mean you cannot really decide now. It's, it's like you're going to make the wrong decision. And that was a huge part of our research. We, we had to rely on more collaboration from researchers in Korea who have more experience in that particular sensor. And, uh, and, and we haven't even reached yet uh, a working system that we, we feel like this is definitely a slam dunk. But then that becomes a research. Then that, that shape up, if I want to do a smart floor project, if, if, if let's say some researchers in Brazil working on positioning, indoor positioning, and they want to do a smart floor, then uh, they, should start, they, should, they should avoid certain technologies, focus on other technologies. Uh, uh, MEMS accelerator will be one of them. And basically try to solve the challenges, like the, the variability of the shoe type and all that stuff. That sets the research agenda. So that's an example of the first lesson that we learn. Second lesson is you're not writing a program here. This is not a, it's not a Java program uh, that you write and you debug and has no bugs now and you run it. And after you run it, if, if it has a problem, it will crash. If you crash, you will figure out why and you fix it again and it does exactly what's supposed to do. When you build a system like this, it, this is not a simple program. It's not even an, an artificial intelligence model. It's not even a machine learning model. Machine learning model is, is, is the best effort. Basically, give it bad data, give you bad model. Give it better data, give you better model. But at least it has that linear relationship. You give it even, even much, much better data, it give you much, much better uh, models. So at least it has that rational behavior. No, here you're not doing a program or a, a machine learning model. Here you are creating some kind of a, a, a complex system. And its main trait is uncertainty. So you have to remember that when you work in this area of smart homes, you are creating, not creating a smart home only, you are creating smart home and creating uncertainty. So uncertainty is your byproduct. And therefore, you have to go back and figure out how can I minimize this uncertainty? really contain it, put some bounds on it. So that's, that becomes the research. So computer scientists working on uh, the data science aspect of smart homes and uh, also models, all that, they, sh they should find new methods to, to put bounds on uncertainty. If you put bounds on uncertainty, you can say things, for example, you can say this smart house uh, works 92% of the time. So if I sell a smart house to somebody, I'm not lying. I have a bound because I, I have a proven bound. So anyway, um, let's talk about what uncertainty is here. So let's, let's face it, most of smart home have sensing system. So you start with sensors. So you have a sensor, you collect sensor data from one direction. Once you collect sensor data, you, uh, you try to feed it into uh, an observational system, which is usually uh, based on, let's go from the other side, based on a model. So you create a model. 
uh, let's say using probabilistic, probabilistic uh, methods like uh, Markov chain. So you create a chain, that's your model, or you could, there are other methods to do it. But in, in activity recognition, you usually you use these kind of activity graphs, which which lead into Markov models. So you're creating a, a model of a, of a specific activity you're trying to sense here. So you're thinking you, you're sensing and you think you know what you're sensing. So you say, I want to know when a person uh, is preparing, preparing a breakfast, okay? Or I wanna know when a person is in, uh, on, uh, on pain, there's pain. So you, you have something, you wanna, you wanna recognize it. So you create a model for it and you start fitting the environment with uh, appropriate sensors and you start collecting data. <clears throat> to create this, that model, you have to first analyze the target domain and the activity. So you sit down by yourself, which is a mistake, or you sit down with domain experts, domain experts, which is the right thing to do. And you as a computer scientist, domain interest, uh, go back and forth, analyze the target domain, model the target activity until you feel like, ah, you, you really created a reasonable model. So that's going back and forth, okay? Uh, so that's great, but guess what? You can have errors. You can have wrong conception on the model. You can have wrong conception even in, in the analysis of the model. It's not perfect. Why? Because there is no science there. We don't have a science for modeling. If I tell you uh, bad hygiene, people who go to the bathroom and uh, they exhibit bad hygiene. So if you, you, what do you think? I say, oh, you think you know it. You think, oh, they don't wash their hands. All right, that's fine. It's probably true, but is that all? We don't have that. We don't, we don't, we're not taught in, in school, in elementary school or high school or college, how people use bathrooms. It is not a science. So you see that? That's where you're getting into when you go to a smart home. You're walking into territories that are undefined, unchartered. So you do your best to create a model as a computer scientist. You sit down next to a domain expert. You go back and forth. You create, and now you have that. But you may have exhibited error here or error there. Now, you, you, you choose a sensor. The choice of sensor can be erroneous. But now you collect the sensor data. You try to get the data into the system. And at that point, you want to implement an activity recognition algorithm. So you come up with an algorithm. One, two, three, four. You're, you're, you're doing yourself a favor to detect what you want to detect. I think that's my cat. Michino. I think Liverpool got lost because Mish is telling me. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, you can see here how many errors, how many places where you can do errors. So how to cope with uncertainty? Because you're not sure the data is actually coming out of the sensor. You're not sure the sensor is working. If the data come out of the sensor, you're not sure if it's noise or actual data. So uh, you have to deal with all this. So what do people do? We will look at the semantic rich modeling approach, meaning in, since it's a complex system, a lot of uncertainty, you might as well increase the complexity of the model itself, make the model bigger, wider, so that it survive, it survive all these potential uncertainty. The second thing is people resort to inherently more certain sentience abstraction. Yeah, what does that mean? Well, in, in all these models, you have what's called observation, meaning uh, date coming out, data. Uh, we refer to data as raw data. Data is just raw data. But the raw data is where uncertainty is carried on. It's almost like the virus that takes the COVID, the COVID virus. That's the virus, it's the raw data, because the data has uncertainty now. Oh, of course, or your model, but let's talk about the data from now. So what do you do? Well, don't use data. What? I'm doing all this to use the data. It's like, yeah, I understand that, but don't use the data, uh, raw data. Try to use more powerful or more uh, inherently certain sentence abstractions. So that's one thing that looked very promising to, to me and my team. We have worked on it, and I believe this is an open problem. A lot of research, a lot of more research needs to be done. I will show you some of that in a second. If you, instead of reading, uh, sensor data, you read something higher, like you're, you're reading a phenomena, for example. That's much more reliable. You're reading, you're reading a behavior, you're reading uh, a trend, 
that's more, much more powerful. But if you know how to define it and read it. Also, we need to do something else, which is we need more programming language concept about how to create application or, or program under uncertainty. That's a big one because uh, Java exception handling, for example, is very limited. So uh, you need more, con more richer concept of dealing with uncertainty itself. Because at the end, no matter what you do, there will be uncertainty. And now you need to, uh, uh, to deal with it. So we try to prevent, alleviate the effect of uncertainty, but then at the same time, we should be ready by programming under uncertainty, we should be ready to, to deal with it. So more research here, this is definitely, so here is one work that uh, Yunju Kim, one of my uh, PhD students, she came up with a very interesting idea, which is uh, semantic rich modeling approach. She expanded what you call activity model has been used heavily and it's very primitive. So she came up with, with an activity model that's very different that differentiates states between key state, unique state, optional state, exclusive state, concurrent state. These are all uh, delineation. These are adding complexity into the modeling. And also the model didn't use to have tool or subject. Uh, so I add, she added tools and subject. Just by complicating the model, she, she takes the same activities, same data sets and try to run it through the model or, and compare it with standard probabilistic Markov chain and the difference was huge in, in the, uh, sort of in the uh, accuracy of the model. That mean, the same data, same uncertainty, different recognition quality. So coming up with more sophisticated semantic rich modeling is one. The main scientists still, uh, the main experts are a must of course in this, in this model. This is how she did it. She created the whole uh, fuzzy algebra uh, to, to be able to, to do this. In fact, when she get the data from the observation system, the data fly, the first thing that she does is she fuzzifies the data. So, uh, which is funny, like you, you're losing the data at that point, you're fuzzifying it. And that's how she obtained a uh, better result. To me, it was almost, uh, I was almost sure she's wrong and she will never get there. So I was really shocked. And, and uh, I had to push my nose to figure exactly how she's implementing this. But that, that's a beautiful work. So there is new rooms for innovation, uh, to, to cope with uncertainty. But that's a second lesson alone. It's a rich, it's a long and rich lesson. Uncertainty, uncertainty, uncertainty. It's our responsibility as computer scientists to solve that problem. If we are to really make smart home, means uh, mainstream like smartphones. This is an area that sits on our shoulders. We have to, we have to uh, work in this area. We have to come up with breakthroughs. This is another uh, coping with uncertainty using virtualization. Uh, There's another PhD student, Raja Bose. That's an easy one where you, you don't have to deal with raw data. You're, you deal with a virtual uh, uh, sensor, for example, a container, and the container has subscriber, let's say three subscribers. And uh, the container has more element now. It has, for example, it has its history. So even if the three element die or become, you can actually look at the history and still provide an answer. <laughs> Based on previous answer, this is the sensor value, okay? So uh, using containers and, uh, and also if one dies and you have quorums, you say, well, I rely on the other two. So that's an easy, very easy principle, but it made a big difference. And then Raja took this up. Let me quit all this. Uh, to move into phenomena cloud. So Raja took it into phenomena cloud and that really was powerful because in our smart home, a smart floor, we used to have problems. Okay, so the problem is we, since we start flaking up, it really messes up our system. And he said, let's not read sen uh, uh, pressure sensor on the smart floor. From now on, we're reading walking phenomena. We're reading walking phenomena. That's all you need to, re to read. If there is a walking phenomenon, the person is walking. Okay, so uh, he moved from erroneous situation to almost error-free. Uncertainty was almost hundred percent. He's able to get it. So he the trick is to instead of reading one sensor, you read a bunch of sensor, a phenomena. Phenomena cloud is defined in computer science, so we used it, uh, where you have some sensors that are idle, some are potential candidates, some are tracking, some are candidate to track. 
Uh, okay. So uh, and that's all published in TOS, transaction, uh, ACM Transaction Sensor Network. I don't want to dwell on it. I just want to give you a sense and a taste of, of these things. So here, what we did is, what Yunju did is uh, uh, she created a semantic rich model. What Raja did, he said, let's not read raw data, let's read uh, powerful sentence abstractions that are inherently more uh, robust and uh, against uncertainty. So that's that's his work, and he, he that's that's the walking phenomenon. Try to uh, just uh, just give you a picture of, of uh, what is the walking phenomenon is. Okay, I think I'm uh, I need to cut here because there's more to cover. This is another uh, kind of concept also to to combat uh, uncertainty. That's new work with Jay Wong Lee. He's now an assistant professor at the University of New York. Uh, I graduated from my lab, but let's let's just move quickly. Um, yeah, I want to just say a few words here. So here is your smart home devices, uh, health devices, whatever sensors they produce raw data, and here is your application. So that's that's what we mean by sentence abstraction: is uh, don't rely on the on the raw data, rely on other things such as context. You can define context and base all your application logic on context. It's context programming. Okay, in fact, that exists, context-aware computing. But here we're talking about pure context. Events. Events fold a lot of sensor data, a lot of, a lot of scenarios into one thing. If the event happened, the semantics of the event is much richer than any single raw data. Why don't you use event, which is event processing. All right, we, we as computer scientists, actually contemporary computer science, we know eventing and event processing and event system and uh, J nodes and all that. Well, let's put it to use. Use just events, activities, behavior, uh, and more phenomena, uh, uh, sentence abstractions. The, 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 the other challenge for computer scientists is this. If, I, if, if you give me like a toolkit, like Apple has this uh, smart home toolkit, Google has one, Let's say that academia now is going to do something even more puff, and you're going to give a, a home kit for people to develop, for developers to develop apps. Then if I'm a developer and you, you came up with something that is really bigger than uh, Google and Apple, what I expect? I expect in that toolkit, you give me ways to read the data, raw data, okay, if I want, to also uh, uh, define context, define event, Define phenomena cloud, like the one that I showed you. Uh, because my same, even the single same application might benefit from all these abstractions based on what is it that are being sensed, right? And allow me to do this all in my application. That means that there has to be sort of a, a runtime that enable that. And that runtime will go crazy, will be very inefficient uh, if all these different sentence abstractions are not consolidated into some computational structure. Think of a compiler design. A compiler creates these expression trees and aggressively keep optimizing it, right? So we need something like this. We need to allow concurrent, simultaneous sentence, multiple simultaneous sentence abstractions to be utilized in building application. To me, this is a powerful PhD or PhDs uh, I haven't started to work on it uh, yet. All right, uh, Marcus, I have to keep asking you about time because uh, I have two more lessons, so I need to, to budget. Yeah. Uh, uh, how many times do you give me? I, I get to five minutes or 10 minutes, is okay? Okay, so I'll, I'll opt for five minutes so I can give five minutes for questions. Yeah, yeah. okay, perfect. Let me see where I am and what do I have. Okay, I know how to do this uh, quickly. The, the second thing is, don't try to uh, solve a problem by creating a solution in that space of smart home. This is very difficult, very expensive, very costly. So uh, also, uh, uh, principal investigators, like professors, should not write grants to solve a problem directly. You have to first uh, write a grant to create a platform that address 
a problem because uh, there is no single way to know what is the best solution. So you have to invest first in creating a platform. Once you create the platform, it's so easy to put a solution, doesn't work, knock it off another, but now you are not building all the layers or doing all the work again and again and again. So the idea of platform is very important. We refer to this as the 28 year rule. 20% is to just develop it and 80% to get it right. So uh, let me skip all this. Uh, that's an example of a, a particular platform uh, for digital health for asthmatic uh, children, for example. If you try to build a solution, the probability that your solution work to detect uh, asthma attack before it happened, it's almost like 5%, <laughs> okay? So it would be so silly to try to create a solution. You have to team with a lot of people to create a platform and now try all sorts of solutions. So that's a lesson we learned. Lesson four is make it two way. We keep talking about sensors and data and analyzing and figuring out what's happening. That's all one, one direction of traffic. There has to, if there is no other direction of traffic going into the space and into the user to, uh, to, to do any change, then uh, it's almost like a, a car uh, where the, uh, it's, the clutch is not on, it's neutral, <laughs> nothing will happen. You can sense as much as you want. So don't forget that it's a two way street. So we have to figure out how do we go back to the user to make the user do things or to not do things or to affect the user? How do we influence the user? This is not easy because we can write code that very easily turn on and off a switch. We, we know how to do that, to activate a switch, but we cannot write code that make, uh, I don't know, uh, Juan uh, stop eating what he's eating, right? <laughs> we cannot activate people easily. So it's a problem. So you need a lot of work in this area. And, and there, there is indeed a lot of people, a big community called persuasive computing. And uh, I had the honor to work with two PhD students. Uh, Ducky Lee was one of them. He created a very interesting model. The issue is to try to be successful in convincing and also try to be uh, uh, able to measure the conversions. See if the person is actually being convinced or not. And to try to figure out if not, then to, to what extent you have to go reinforce your approach. So these are the reinforcement loop here. You can see them. But I don't want to get into the detail. I just want to tell you the lesson we learned is this is an important area, which is how to bring the, how to secure the collaboration and the cooperation of the user in very, very human-centric systems. It's computer systems, smart homes, but they are very human-centric. If you forget to create pathways into the user and to ensure the user collaboration, then uh, I think that would be a big mistake. It's something missing here. So there's a lot of work. We have done work here. It's a beautiful area to, to uh, need you of more research. I would definitely recommend it. Now, um, we can skip all this. Lesson six uh, is very, uh, uh, that's the last lesson. It's not all sensors, hardware, and, and stuff like that. So there's still one bit that relate to us, computer science, and that is uh, uh, service science, service science. Because you cannot say that uh, Uber, I don't know, is Uber in, uh, operating in uh, Brazil? Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, so you cannot say Uber is not a part of the computing uh, technology, is not part of our new reality, you know, the internet, and mobile and mobile, it is definitely part of it, right? It's it's a computer technology. So what is Uber? Uber is a if you look at it from uh, an asset point of view, the initial version of Uber, it shouldn't be worth thirty thousand dollars. Just few um, lines of codes. You have an app for the driver, an app for the passenger, a small cloud service. Come on, this is a very simple system, right? and uses existing, tons of existing services like GPS and all that. But uh, Uber is more than technology. Uber has uh, the thinking, the service science. So similarly to, to Uber, Uber solve a lot of problems. So Uber tell us or give us the lesson that solution in smart home doesn't have to all be hardware and software and, and systems. It could also include service. It could also include service. So. 
think of creating these kind of uh, uh, uberized concept within the loops of the smart house. To just give you a simple idea, no matter how smart my house is, and an older person living in it, he, he just loves something. He loves, I uh, know, he loves a uh, uh, chocolate bar. Okay, he, he, loves, he loves it. And he would love to eat it uh, often. And my smart home would do everything for him. But he wants a chocolate bar at 9 p.m. today. And it's 9 p.m. He wants chocolate bar. He cannot get it. So the smart home is not smart because it, it didn't... It didn't finish. It didn't comply to his aspiration. But if the smart home is linked up with Uber Eats, then it will get him that. So, so just to give you a, a little bit of an example. But then we discovered that so many things that the smart home is trying to do difficult, in a difficult way can be done by incorporating human elements with technology elements packaged as services within a microservice, uh, uh, microservice uh, uh, economical uh, uh, framework. So why don't we think about it? Why don't we include services to be part of the smart house? Basically, you're bringing people to do things. For, so so uh, that thinking should be there. So it's not only sensors, not only hardware. Um, I promise to tell you a little bit about what smart radio home is. Uh, I don't have time, and I want to give you some time for questions. But but I'll just say here a couple of things about them. Here, this is this is uh, the Windai Garden Village in England, the healthy new town. As we're building it, we, uh, my contribution to this project was: let's not build any smart home. All homes should be smart ready. That means that uh, home should have what what I what I coined as digital plumbing, digital plumbing. So our homes have plumbing, electricity, right? So now let's add the digital plumbing into them. Digital plumbing make them homes that, <clears throat> let's see if I have it written here. Yeah, uh, homes that uh, are already wired uh, for network, uh, wired and wirelessly, and the wireless coverage is uniform. You have no issue of pocket everywhere in the house. Every inch has the same wireless coverage. Uh, it has uh, an edge computer. Any home has to have an edge computer. And, and it has to have audio-video connectivity. Everywhere there should be audio-video connectivity. So you are able to input or output audio or video. It has to be able to house and power and hide IoT and sensors in modular connectivity. So in other words, you have to have places to hide technology, either on the ceiling, on the floor, on the wall, on the baseboard, remember the baseboard and the bottom of the wall? Okay, that's called the British people called skirt skirt board. That's imagine that skirt board you can actually push out and give you a beautiful opening. You can able to, and it has USB power. So think of these architectural elements. So architect has to also come into that concept where you're building a home that has all this, also has <clears throat> circuit breaker, has to be digital meaning any point, any switch and any plug has to be turned on and off and dim and controlled by software. So if you, if you put all this together in a home, uh, the home is not smart, but we refer to it as smart ready. Okay? And then also authentication elements so that you're able to download apps into the home directly. <coughs> so a smart home becomes ready to become smart, uh, but uh, the doctor prescribed, let's say a dementia home, to the doctor, say RX dementia home. Dementia home now will take uh, somebody from the tech shop to go for uh, 40 minutes, just drop certain sensor, know where to put them, and call an 800 number to activate the service. And now we have a smart home. It's it's focused on dementia. That idea, the coupling, the application domain, and the needs, and the and uh, and even everything. You're decoupling everything. You're not even putting uh, uh, other than minimal standard sensors. All other sensors will be added on. That's the idea of a smart radio home. It relies on the principle of digital plumbing. This is a smart skirt that I was talking to you about. In the smart house, we have the, 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 the floor down here, but we also had what's called dropped crown molding. <laughs> Drop, that's where we used to hide a lot of stuff. Nobody can see it, and it has power. 
So anyway, um, my conclusion is let's build on the momentum we have today. We must strengthen and adapt and adopt smart ready uh, or smart home in a box ecosystem. We need to engage the housing sector. We need to help make the smart ready homes uh, technology affordable, cheaper. We need to innovate more intuitive interfaces. Uh, while I didn't cover privacy and security, they are really important. I don't talk about them because I'm not an expert in them. But uh, this point here is to say, don't forget them. They're very important. I will stop here and turn the floor to you, Marcus. Thank you very much. Uh, Sumi, it was a very very nice and uh, inspiring uh, talk. I, I just wanted to, to jump to the, the topics and start researching them now. <laughs> So it's very nice. Uh, well, I, I uh, would like to open the, the floor for, for questions. I have some too, but I don't want to give the chance also to, to other people to, to ask something. So, so anybody in, in the audience who wants to ask something? Well, I, I, I have one. One uh, <clears throat> issue: uh, uh, How do you uh, compare the the, uh, the monitoring and the tracking of elderly people and of patients with uh, with wearable devices compared to sensors installed in the house? I mean, uh, how far are we? now from uh, being able to monitor the health of people with, with the variables instead of instrumenting the, uh, the house. And uh, if you, have, you can use the, the, the smartphone, uh, the smartphone as, a, as, a gateway, as, a, uh, as a gateway, uh, maybe, uh, in order that the wearable sends data to the, the, the smartphone and then you, you can uh, collect it and even if it's, May be interesting because you can also know what the user is doing with the smartphone. So uh, you you can uh, see if he's uh, using the smartphone or if the smartphone is, is only in his, in his pocket. So you you may uh, infer if the person uh, is well is well on or not. Or what do you think? That's a good question. Um, so I think uh, uh, all these types of sensors. Uh, uh, are expected to be relevant and important. Uh, your question was wearable or just built in the environment, which one would be better? So, so I said, all of them would be relevant ba based on what they're trying to do. But um, if, if you try to find out, for example, the heart rate and the breathing rate of a person using a wearable, you say, no, 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 that's wrong because now we're able to do it in an unencumbered way. So why do you do it with wearable? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so we can use now RF technology, just regular RF from the, from uh, from your access point, to actually get uh, get a little bit of an approximation of, of something like this. Mm -hmm. More so recently, radar technology, radar technology, radar. yeah, became extremely promising. Um, uh, because it's miniaturized, its antenna, ceramic antenna, is much smaller. They're able to do what you call orthogonal detection. And orthogonal detection means you, you didn't have to have a, pre, uh, a predetermined uh, direction of the mo movement, right? You are able to, to detect everywhere. So you, you will see now significant move to use uh, uh, radar to detect things, to detect motion, to detect, for example, the breathing rate, as I mentioned to you, heart rate. So we have more and more ammunition, more technology to get certain wearable off the person. So the rule, of, the golden rule is if you can do it in an unencumbered way, meaning without wearables, do it. Absolutely. Definitely. For sure. But something like blood pressure becomes difficult with what with all we know is very difficult so if somebody invent uh, a watch that actually tell me my blood pressure yeah. uh, the, so so that uh, uh, Imran just came up with one Imran came up with one. It was a little bulky and still not highly accurate um 
if 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 wearable will solve blood pressure, that will be amazing because a lot of people get uh, strokes because of sustained the high blood pressure. So just knowing it, taking an action, then everything is good. So it's very useful to have a wearable of that form. Also, things such as uh, AFib. AFib is difficult to detect by in an uncumbered way. Uh, and it's also difficult to detect using Apple Watch. Apple Watch is only 33% accurate when it comes to uh, AFib. But they're working on that. So it depends. If you can do it totally unencumbered, absolutely. Then no going back. But the more you get off the person, the better. But let me now bring it back to where it's the opposite. If I want to, to sense what's called behavioral marker, behavioral marker, then I want wearable. I want phone. Because in the phone, as you said, I will find out if you are using Facebook and if you're using LinkedIn, if you're sending email, if yeah, you're yeah. talking, school, yeah. then I have I have the behavioral marker and social isolation, for example, rely on behavioral marker. So I want that wearable and that uh, device. So it depends. So I will never discount any type. I say this is better than that. But I'll just put some rules that if you can do it without encumbering the patient, absolutely. There is no point to using uh, using wearable for that in that case. Okay, thank you very much. So, so any other question? The other one. So I have another uh, point. I I like very much your, your architecture with the layers. Uh, the the beneath and the edge and the cloud, and then you have the the intelligent. Uh, uh, sentiment uh, 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 abstractions. Uh, yes. it, it, it seems very reasonable that you built in uh, in the middleware or, or the platform those uh, services. But how do you think? Yeah, exactly yeah, this one. But how, how do you think it will be? Is the, the the effort to combine the data? I mean, combine the context data with the event data with the activities data. So I. I imagine that that uh, depending on what you want to uh, to sense or uh, to, to monitor, it shall be very difficult, very complex to to know uh, which event on which context and which activities and uh, and so on. So 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 have you any idea of how this uh, the, uh, integration of those uh, uh, abstractions could be done? Yes, that's a very good question. Uh, uh, of course, uh, I start by saying it's very challenging, but uh, but I have a very clear idea of what is it that it need to be done, and I'll show you uh, a straightforward idea to implement it, which is the worst, <laughs> which is totally unoptimized. So imagine that indeed that's runtime right here, and uh, we have a, a runtime sub engine for every sentence abstraction. So we have a runtime sub engine for context, for events, for phenomena cloud. Okay. And now let's go. We have two sides. One side is the application. So suppose I have uh, several applications, smart home. Let's talk about one of them. This application here, she, it wants to use uh, events. So every time you want to use event, you use uh, subscribe, uh, notify, so, so uh, subscribe, publish model. So I subscribe for that specific event I want. I subscribe for another, another application subscribe. Okay. So now this guy is a sub engine isolated. It doesn't know anything about this guy or this guy or anything else. It's focused on itself. And now the event is defined over these uh, devices and these devices, uh, also uh, publish, they always publish to the engines. So this en engine here, the events, it did get a publication. And now it's able to see that certain events satisfied, so it notified. So that's one view from one sentence abstraction. The other one is a phenomena cloud, as I, as I showed you before. Uh, so it, it's also trying to, like, like here, these are the phenomena cloud uh, sort of... Uh, uh, space where, where it needs to sense. So it's connected to all these guys. And then now when a phenomena actually clicks, when you have one black, uh, sorry, not one black, when you have uh, multiple black like here, so this like this is like mm, one node, but they, here you have more confidence. So now the phenomena happens, so you start reporting. So you report. 
Okay, so we can actually implement this easily by having sub engine. Every engine is uh, isolated and independent, but that's obviously totally unoptimized, and that will kill that edge and also will will drain these these devices. So what we need is to find intermediate structures, intermediate structure, because it's the same data that's flying in. Mm -hmm. it's the same data, right? But these are different sentence abstraction, different way of looking at them. And uh, they have an end structure. They have their own end structure, right? Like uh, an event would be probably a hierarchical tree, correct? And uh, phenomena cloud, as I showed you, it could be what you call ear graph, an ear graph, right? So they have their own structure, but they all are built using the same observation, same uh, data. So to satisfy all of them, it looks to me, there must be intermediate structures, optimal intermediate structure that can be done so that we don't computation, compute anything or perform any computation uh, more than uh, once or more than it need to be computed. That's the idea. How can you create an intermediate structure so that the total structure, total uh, uh, graphs, for example, of, of all sense abstraction is minimized and total work is minimized? You see? Because you, you can go with totally unoptimized everybody alone, but then that is, that's a killer. So how can we do better than that? It, it, to me, it evoked the idea of compiler optimization, but it needs someone uh, actually from the compiler community to start looking at it, a programming language com and, pro and compiler design person to start looking at it. It needs a combination of, uh, of uh, uh, intra, intra domain, meaning all computer scientists, but, but with different strengths to look at it, to be able to formulate the problem, try to find a solution. I, I hope I... <laughs> And what you are uh, implying is that the source code that you're compiling is the application then that you have. So you have the yeah. application code and you compile it and then you will choose exactly which kind of, of uh, services you need and which of the uh, phenomena you need, which in turn will define which uh, data you need from the centers. Exactly. Uh, when you compile it, it generates an uh, expression tree. Mm -hmm. The tip, the tip part, the top tip part of the exhibition tree is dedicated to you, to, to that application. But a bulk of that structure is shared structure. Uh, sure, sure. It's yeah. fragments, fragments of all shared pieces. That's the idea. I have to do it. Okay. Uh, this, this would be very powerful, extremely powerful. And if this happened, this beats the, I mean, that makes Apple Kit and Google Kit to be baby, like nothing. Because now you are really able to create very powerful uh, applications. You are able to scale up many things. I can have now instead of just a 7, 12 sensor or device in my home, I can have 200. I can have anything I want. I can have all kinds of applications. I can uh, uh, download the application from the app stores. We still don't have an app store for smart home, but that's coming, of course. So I can download these apps, and I'm enjoying it. But how can that happen uh, uh, without draining? Because notice, not only it's a time complexity that it will take forever, the edge would be uh, jammed, but also everybody is independently and individually going down. That's famous problem in database, which is a mm -hmm. redundant data acquisition, right? Mm -hmm. So that will drain the batteries of these devices, like a medical device. Like, seriously, why do you go a million times? You already have it. Okay, so... This is, this is a nice problem, but it needs uh, an optimization professor, compiler professor, and more system professor. These three together can actually crack it, I suppose. Mm -hmm. But uh, I haven't cracked it yet. Yeah. Yeah, so thank you very much for, for the, 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 the answer. So, so last uh, chance to, to the audience, if uh, one of you want to... to, to, to to ask something, nobody are all, all people are tired now. We have here seven thirty. Yeah, uh, it's time to, to to have dinner soon. So, so I, I I think that there are so many topics that that we uh, that I'm interested in, that that we should uh, uh, pursue uh, uh, together. That there are 
two ways of doing it. Either we have such a, a talk every week, or you come to Brazil. <laughs> so you can we, we can come up with something in between. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so, so thank you very much. It was very, very nice. Uh, 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 Flavia and, uh, and Paulo, uh, they, they apologized that they had, had to leave before, but they liked very much your, your talk. So I just read um, no problem at all. I enjoy giving the talk, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, I hope that uh, the recording would be useful to to others who couldn't course, make it. Definitely, definitely. Thank you for inviting me. Marcus. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Bye bye. See you. Bye bye. Bye bye.